Obrigado pela vossa presença. Isto é a primeira em Portugal do filme Patterson do Jim Jarmusch. Eu estarei aqui com ele no final do filme para fazermos uma conversa, como previsto. Uh, e também estará o Carter Logan, que é o produtor com ele do filme. E uh, aqui estaremos. Eu também vou ver o filme agora. Uh, porque o filme, tirando o Festival de Cannes, praticamente foi impossível de ver. Mesmo nós não o podemos ver antes. Uh, por questões uh, que o filme ainda não estreou nos Estados Unidos. E por isso... Uh, eles têm um cuidado muito grande e, portanto, não, não tem sido fácil uh, conseguir as projeções do filme. Felizmente, uh, conseguimos ter aqui o filme no festival e, e pronto, e uma boa projeção e até já. Ron, por favor. A presença de Ron Padgett é requerida. Please. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can go there later. <laughs> Your presence precedes you. <laughs> you I think Jim and then yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, really thank you for this marvelous movie. Uh, I present Carter Logan, Jim Jarmusch, Ron Padgett. Thank you for the debate. Thank you, Paolo. And thank you all for coming. Are you still awake, though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of you are. <laughs> Uh, Jim, uh, this film is, um, is uh, you knew already uh, Patterson or is from William Callard Williams that you have the idea to come in and film in the, in, the, in the city where he lived and it was from what point you start this project? Well, I, I visited Patterson. Uh, it's a small city, not far from New York City, and I visited it for just a day, uh, maybe 25 years ago. And I really was drawn there because of the poetry of William Carlos Williams, and uh, I just wanted to see this, this city. And I went there and spent the day, and I sat uh, on the, by the waterfall in the same place where Patterson sits in our film, and I just had a very vague idea of maybe making a film there one day. I, I walked around the industrial buildings there, and afterwards I, and I, I had been drawn to the, the place by William Carlos Williams, and uh, he has one book-length poem that you see in the film called Patterson. Um, which I must say is not my favorite of his writing. Some of it I just maybe don't understand. But uh, the beginning of the poem is a metaphor uh, about a man, the city of Patterson being a man, and he's describing the rock formations above the waterfall like a reclining man. And I just had this idea of making a film about a man named Patterson who lives in Patterson who is working class and makes uh, and writes poetry. And I just kept this idea for many years. And, and then I, I was very interested in the history of Patterson, which I won't start spouting off about because it's very intricate and fascinating. It was a model uh, industrial city envisioned by Alexander Hamilton and uh, was the center of textiles in the United States. and center of a lot of union activism and anarchists and a lot of interesting things there. But anyway, I carried this idea for a long time and uh, then I wrote the script some not too many years ago uh, and I, I had this idea of the poetry in the film being written by one of my very favorite poets, Ron Padgett. And so I uh, first sent him the script and he called me back saying, 
Well, gee, Jim, uh, I guess you're really going for those big uh, commercial film, making a film about a poet who's a bus driver <laughs> in Patterson. But anyway, he did relent to let us use some of his existing poems and even writing new poems for the film. So I, I'm so honored that he's here and that he, he contributed this. <laughs> this is the, shut up. <laughs> this, no, but this essence of the film, so seriously. And he gave, uh, maybe some of you were there last night, a beautiful reading of some of his stuff. And this guy, he, he produced, was one of the two main producers of this film. He is my colleague. Together we have a band called Squirrel. Uh, we wrote, compo we made the music for the film together also. So he, ha he wears many hats also. But uh, I don't know, I'm just talking too much. But we're so happy to be here to show our film here. And, and thank you, Paolo, for having us here. Uh, now I have to leave because I've, <laughs> I've said too much. You're a very important person. <laughs> I have a dentist appointment. <laughs> No, the poems were uh, written uh, uh, before you start shooting completely, or did you ask Ron to, to uh, um, read, uh, written some poems after uh, the film was already made, or everything was first uh, made before? Well, for me, uh, 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 the films, I always are, uh, they emerge as we start working. So I knew I wanted poems of Ron's, and for example, the poem, Love Poem, was a poem he'd written many years ago, mm -hmm. um, uh, which mentions blue t Ohio blue tip yeah. matches. So then this became part of the film and the matches in the film came from Ron's poem. And then there are other poems that he wrote, the run and the, the last poem in the film, which I love, an old song, and uh, another poem or two were things he wrote for the film. But I, I won't speak for him because he, he might get very violent later. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh I've been asked by some journalists here uh, about collaborating with Jim. And the only thing I could think of was how incredibly easy it was for me. First, he used poems I wrote many years ago for my wife. And, um, and then he called me on the phone and said, oh, Ron, if you want to write a few poems for the movie, that would be really nice. But you don't have to do anything. Don't worry. We have enough material. And so I said, well, Jim, I'm not going to write anything for this film. It's too much pressure. I, I can't stand the pressure. And he said, that's fine, Ron. Don't worry. Don't worry. I hung up. Five minutes later, I start writing a poem for the movie <laughs> <laughs> because he told me I didn't have to. And so it made it, it was all really very easy. And uh, everybody on this company that I met, uh, from, uh, from Adam Driver to, to the producers, uh, to, to Carter, uh, everybody was just great uh, to, uh, I, watched, I got to watch them work and shoot uh, the cupcake making uh, scene in the morning. I had so much fun with them. <laughs> and you know, poets don't get this kind of opportunity very often, if ever. So I, I feel very, very blessed. I want to say one more little thing. I don't know if you know this, Jim, but uh, in uh, 1964, I was 22 years old. And I and a poet friend of mine, two poet friends of mine, we went to uh, the home of William Carlos Williams. He had died two years before that. But we just drove up to look at his house. And one of us uh, uh, sent his wife up to knock on the door, because we were scared to knock. And the door opened, and his wife said, come on, come on. And we went up, and it was uh, William Carlos Williams' wife Flossie Williams was still living there, and she invited us into the home, and she showed us, oh, here's where Bill wrote some of his poems, here's Bill's library, here's paintings that belong to Bill, and, uh, and then she gave us some, uh, some beer and some cookies. 
<laughs> and it was, a, it was, for me, it was a very, very thrilling moment. And when I heard that you were working on this film, you know, inspired by Williams, it really, it really got to me. Oh, anyway. Well, you know, it's, uh, William Carlos Williams, if you don't know, was a, a pediatric doctor. He was a physician. And he delivered over 2,000 babies. And, uh, you know, many great poets and writers had very, you know, menial, had, had other kinds of jobs. A doctor's not a menial job, but when you think of Apollinaire and Kafka and these people, uh, Robert Walzer and even Frank O'Hara, the great New York poet, uh, was the curator of the New York, of the uh, MoMA of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and he wrote poems on his lunch break. And I, you know, I, poets are so incredibly uh, uh, valuable, and, uh, you know, they just, none of them did it for the money, you know? Like, show me some rich poets. I, I don't, I don't know any. Um, even Wallace Stevens, he was an insurance executive, one of our great American poets, and, uh, when he won, I don't know, a Pulitzer Prize or something, one of his associates who was a, like a vice president of the insurance company, his response was, Wally writes poetry? <laughs> you know, I have no idea. But, uh, you know, to me, poets are, that's why they are so incredibly valuable. It's because they love this beautiful form and uh, kind of abstraction of thought and of and this literary form. And, you know, when Ron came to our set, our whole crew, because they, we had read the script, and it's, there's a lot about poetry in the script, and everyone was very excited, you know, Ron Padgett, he's coming to watch us yeah. work, you know, it was... That was a real shock for me. <laughs> yeah, but it was like, for us, like a rock star's coming on our set, you know? And I said, just don't ask him for money. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's so incredible, you know, the choice of the two actors, you know. We think that you wrote already thinking in Adam Driver and Gold Shift Day, because they are really, you know, uh, and it was, I hope, I think, you know, your first choice, and you, uh, no, at least at what I, I, fe I feel, you know, and... Well, uh, yeah, it's strange because on almost all of my other films, I've always had the actors in mind while I was writing the script. Uh, um, and I, I have done that often. And then, pre, you know, I've presumed that they would possibly do the film. And I, I've been very lucky, and they have. But in this case, I did not have the actors in mind. I didn't really... I didn't know who I was going to have in the film. And uh, first, well, you know, Adam Driver, I, I saw a few things he was in, and then I, I heard an interview that he gave, and I became really interested in wanting to meet him. And I met him, and I was like, this is the guy I want, I want to collaborate with. And uh, Golshifta Farahani, I had, on, I had seen First, some years ago, 2006, in a beautiful film called Half Moon um, by Baman Gobadi, who's a Kurdish uh, Iranian uh, director who, who made a beautiful film, also uh, Turtles Can Fly. And I, I loved her, but I wasn't thinking of her at all. And um, Sarah Driver, who is my main I don't know, she advises me on my script and editing, one of the few people I trust. She said, well, you love that actress, uh, Golshifta Farahani, you know, why don't you have, and in the script, she wasn't Persian American, she was just an American character. And she said, why don't you talk to her or, or meet, or somehow, you know, you, you love that actress, so I, had a Skype conversations with Golshifta, who, who was just here yeah. um, with her film, uh, The Patient's Stone. Was, yeah. And uh, I, I Skyped with her. She was in uh, Australia. And I just fell totally in love with her and the idea of her being this character. And uh, so I was very happy to have these two actors who I had not thought of before. 
I was very, very lucky to, to get to collaborate with them. Carter, it was, um, I don't know, you have so many, uh, you know, roles, but uh, let's talk about uh, something that sometimes is, is not the most interesting thing, but anyway, it was difficult to finance the movie, it was difficult to put it in, it took time, what, you know, uh, because for America, it's, uh, anyway, is is not a very, you know, what you, you can say, co commercial, you know, project. That's, uh, I'd like to know how you, you could, uh, you know, finance a film of Jim like this. Yeah, you know, it's, um, films like ours are never easy to finance. Financing and, and getting the casting and scheduling to meet up is one of the biggest challenges we go through. Uh, I'm blessed with having incredible collaborators across the board on this and the principal person who's out there financing, looking for financing for Jim's films is uh, Bart Walker. Um, so he was able to help put this together. We came to a point where we were ready to shoot the film and, and get it financed right at around the time that Amazon Studios was launching. Um, so they were able to come in along with K5, who uh, put some money in and also acquired international sales. So th th that's the sort of boring story, but um, really putting together financing for one of Jim's films involves finding people who are very much with the spirit of the film, with the... Uh, that really genuinely loved the script, that really loved the casting. In this instance, you know, someone who wasn't going to uh, push to have a uh, blonde American woman or something like that. Um, <laughs> and uh, these were two groups of people. Amazon and K5 were incredibly passionate about it. So it was an obvious choice to work with them. And you know, I'm very difficult. I don't, uh, I don't collaborate with the financing people. It's not like they don't, I don't tell them how to run their business. And I don't really like them telling me how to make a film and that's been my way. So I, I am a bit difficult and uh, you have to find people that are trusting in the project and will allow us to choose our collaborators and, and do what we want. So we tricked them again. It worked <laughs> yet again. Yeah. We, we try each time and see if, if there will be a next film. We never know. But. I think it helped on this one that in addition to the, the incredible cast that we had, we had some phenomenal department heads along with us. Uh, Fred Elms, the cinematographer, one of the greatest in the world. I mean, this is a man who shot everything from uh, Blue Velvet to uh, Night on Earth with Jim, uh, pieces of coffee and cigarettes. He'd been someone that Jim had collaborated with quite a bit. Um, really a brilliant, brilliant uh, DP. Mark Friedberg, the production designer, whose work I th you're all familiar with um, from both Broken Flowers, but countless other films of Mira Nair and Wes Anderson, um, incredible costume designer. Um, <clears throat> and um, the list sort of just goes on and on and on. And once we presented these collaborators also to our financing partners, they, they could envision how, I think, l beautiful this film really would be in its execution. And this is the second film that I've worked on that has shot uh, digitally. And uh, the previous one was Night on Earth, uh, sorry, was uh, Only Lovers Left Alive, which was all, almost all at night. And digital is quite beautiful at night with rich blacks and low light, and you can light it with light bulbs, you know? Um, this was more problematic because there's a lot of daylight things, exterior things, which I was very nervous about. Um, but Fred Elms uh, has shot a lot of things 
digitally. He's been studying how to make it look filmic, and uh, and he did such a beautiful job. We we did a lot of work to make it look like film in a way. Um, at times, we put so many what are called neutral density filters in front of the camera because I don't like digital depth of field where everything is in focus. Um, I, I don't like that look. And Fred would put so many filters in front of the lens that it looked almost black, you know? And, uh, but in the end, we got very beautiful results. So, um, and I'm contrary to popular belief, I'm not a Luddite, I'm not against new technologies. To me, they're all tools, you know, and to find the way to use them um, is very interesting to me. So, but I, you know, I had so much help, like Carter just mentioned, from these incredible collaborators. And, and those are just a few, really. The list really <coughs> goes on and on. Afonso Gonzalez, our editor, phenomenal. Um, really, I think his fingerprints are all over this uh, as well. Marvin. Marvin, the bulldog. The dog, uh, Nelly, who plays a transge transgender dog. Yeah. Because <laughs> a female dog, Nelly, played Marvin, a miraculous dog, and uh, really the third most important character in the film. So. You know, and uh, you told me that it was not in the script that yet he, he took the the book of the poems that did. Oh, that was in the script. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> that damn dog, yeah. Uh, any question? Um, thanks for being here. It's a great movie, beautiful, really loved it. Thank you. Um, I loved how the way the film relates to poetry, not just because there's beautiful poetry in it, of course, and because there's a guy who plays a poet, but the way you film details, rhythm, repetition, um, how it seems to be about seeing th things and watching, but also listening. Uh, so that was really, really great. Um, so th the thing about listening, um, because I believe poetry is also about words, but um, silence and and listening to things. And I love sound in your films, not just music, but sound. I don't. Know, I haven't seen you talking about sound that much in interviews or anywhere else. So I I was wondering, um, what do you look for in in sound in your films? Um, it seems to be such an interesting part of working in film, and I was wanting to listen to you uh, on that subject. Well, thanks. You know, to me, if you make a film that isn't a silent film, then sound is 50% of the experience. So sound is incredibly important to me. Um, I've had the, you know, I've worked with the same on-set uh, sound recorder, uh, on-set mixer, Drew Cunyon since uh, 1984, and uh, he is very, very good. I don't like post-synchronized dialogue, etc. Sometimes it's necessary, but uh, we like to get very natural sound. And then I've had the also, I've gotten to work on many films with Bob Hine, who is the sound designer, and we are very, very attentive to the the background textures of all the sounds that we mix in, that we create the film, that creates the sound of the film, to the point where I was talking to someone earlier today that if you hear, for example, birds in the background, we talk very much about what, what season is this? What birds would you hear? Um, the exterior shot of their house, how many trees are nearby, so how many birds what would the density of birds and insects be? Or if you hear a motorcycle in the distance, um, if you hear a Harley Davidson or a, lo a large motorcycle, a cruiser, it has a very different sound than say a 250cc Yamaha motorcycle. Well, all of these things have an effect on you, co your consciousness. You're not listening for 
gee, I wonder what kind of motorcycle that was. But it does affect where you are in the film, the place, how it feels. And uh, Bob Hine is an incredible, uh, he is so attentive to the details of this, you know. And sounds are always very important to me. I, I worked with another uh, incredible sound designer in the past, uh, Chick Ciccolini, and we had an argument once in a film, Ghost Dog, where there was a shot of a particular bird, a pileated woodpecker, and he placed in there the sound of a red-headed woodpecker. And I, I know I'm an amateur ornithologist, whatever, so I said, no, no, Chick, that's not a, that's not a pileated woodpecker, you know, that's a different woodpecker. He was like, hey, who's going to fucking know what kind of woodpecker it is? I was like, well, a few of my friends will know. You've got to have the right woodpecker, you know? So, yes, all of these things are accumulative and how far away they are in the distance. For example, in this film, while we were filming, sometimes we would catch a, a train, a lonesome freight train in the background in our dialogue track that we were recording. And so Bob Hine was studying all these things and he would choose when to move those and where in a dramatic moment, very distant, just for kind of haunting emotional effect. So all of these things are carefully attended to when we do the sound. And uh, I'm so glad you asked because we talk a lot about photography, but uh, the sound is 50% is of the film, unless it's a silent film. And uh, so, yeah, I, I love sounds, I love music, but I love, the, I love the music of life, you know. I was walking in Estoril earlier this evening, and there are these birds in these certain palm trees by the beach that at dusk are so, I was recording them, they are, so chatty, you know, that what are they talking about, man? It's like a, a convention, you know? And they're really, they're celebrating the sun is going down and it's another day ending and they are making music about this, you know? And I had my little iPhone recorder on. But I, I often try to, and also when we film uh, members of our crew, you know, these little Zoom recorders, they're little wonderful little digital recorders. We try to have different members of our crew, like five or six people, carry these around in our pockets in case we hear something interesting and say, God, oh, man, go, go record some of that. That's some people arguing in a bar down the street. I don't know what, you know? Um, so we, we, we try to pass these around and keep them handy to, to capture sound. But yeah, I love sound and the absence of sound, and, and that it's very connected to poetry in the way a, a space on a page where you leave out something and how that feels, and it's the same if you listen to Bach or Miles Davis, you know, where he, where he doesn't play becomes very important. So anyway, thanks for that question, because I'm talking too much about sound. But, uh, <laughs> But it's very important. I think beer is half price downstairs. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. I'm really happy for your presence. Uh, I'm a filmmaker as well. I'm a Brazilian filmmaker. And um, before my question, I would just like to say that uh, Dead Man is a film that influenced my life and my career. Uh, I studied in New York, and uh, it was very important to me. Uh, I actually, I, I think I saw Ghost Dog in the theater, and then I saw, like, who's this guy? And started watching everything you do, and, and I worked in the village, and I know that you like to hang out over there. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, this film, like a lot of your films, like usually like in Hollywood, where you have, like, you know, like the 10 minutes, something happens in 30 minutes, the objective goal and then follows that and like you see a film like this where you just like follow a routine of a couple and you're just following that like the normal the contemporary thing and, and actually if, if there was like a twist it would be like the dog eating the book and that's almost at the end of the film so my question is like how do you uh, 
since you're so far away from the traditional American filmmaking, how do you convey and how do you, what's your process on writing? Uh, how do you, do you, do you think about, how do you think about timing and like the pauses and, and okay, uh, do you think about twists or do you think, or do you, is, do you just start writing like a novel? And I would just like to, to know a little bit, bit more about your creative process in writing. Well, I, I start gathering small details and then I form them into something later. So I'm always collecting little ideas and I'm not quite sure what, how they will, what they will form, you know? Um, I, I, I've been accused of having writing, of having films with no plots and no stories and very slow and nothing happening. Um, I don't mind that because I, uh, I don't know, I do love form very much and my films have forms to them and I, I this film has a very, very minimal, simple form, um, nothing unusual, I'm sure it's used before, of just seven days in a week and, and a kind of routine and, uh, but that's to me a beautiful form and I love uh, variations, I love repetition with variation as a form in art, in music, you know, uh, whether it's Bach or Andy Warhol, I, I love variation. So this film is just a very simple form, formally of variations, but it is, it is formal, you know, it's not thoughtless. Uh, but I don't know, I, I kind of wanted this film from the beginning, I wanted to make a very quiet film. I didn't want to make a film. I just wanted something without conflict, without drama, without abused women. I don't know. Without a lot of action, you know. I, I don't know. Um, there are beautiful films that that follow these these things as well, uh, by Narusa and Ozu and Bresson and uh, other wonderful films in the past. So. Uh, we just wanted to make a kind of quiet film, but the form's very important to me. And some people have said, well, this film is a poem in the form of a film because of the stanzas of the, the days of the week. Um, I think it's more a film in the form of a poem in a way. But I, I'm afraid to even say that near Ron because <laughs> I don't know what he might say about that. But anyway, I, I don't know. I just start very intuitively in the films. We find the film as we make it also. So I never, I only write one draft of a script, the first draft only, and then we start working on the film. And as we work and get locations and the actors, I start writing more changes, adjustments. To me, the final draft is the, the final cut in the editing room. But I don't like laboring over the thing on paper too much. I like it to evolve as we go. I don't know if I even answered your question. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for being here. So I have a question, and uh, don't quote me on this, but I believe that after you made Only Lovers Left Alive, um, you claimed how, how, diff how it's getting more and more difficult to obtain funding for different films or for films that deviate from the norm and uh, especially in, no, only in independent cinema. But I've also heard a lot that um, nowadays it's easier than ever to, to kind of make it just, for example, the, the example I hear is Damien Chazelle with Whiplash who made a short that went to Sundance and then a year later he had a film that went to Sundance and now he's making, you know, big budget pictures. Um, and um, I wanted to know your stance on, um, basically, for, for young filmmakers, what's the landscape going to be like now? And is it easier? Is it harder? How, how is it going to be like? Man, how do we answer that, Carter? Uh, I, I uh, mean, <coughs> the, uh, it's always hard. It's always going to be hard. It's always going to be a struggle to get the money that goes along to fund your creative ideas. It, it's always a struggle. It does not get easier. It's no easier for 
Jim Jarmusch than and any of you. I mean, maybe the budgets are different, maybe the things are different. Jim made a short, too, called Stranger Than Paradise, took it to some festivals, and eventually made a feature-length version of it, just similar to Damien Chazelle or Kevin Smith with um, uh, Clerks. Clerks. Um, so uh, there's certain patterns that work. I, I think the important thing is to just never give up trying to do what you're going to do. Speak uh, from your heart, truthfully, uh, and... Uh, I think if you're trying to get a first project made, come up with something that's realistic that you can do within your means, and then just make it. You have to just keep making things. I mean, these are people who are really determined to create. And uh, I think if you're relentless about that, hopefully eventually it gets recognized and pays off. But also, um, Recently, we lost the great Iranian director, Abbas Kiristami, and uh, at his memorial service in New York, uh, Ma Martin Scorsese was talking about being on a jury with Abbas, um, judging short films by young filmmakers. And M Marty said he was very perplexed as to how to evaluate these films, and he didn't quite know what to do. And Abbas said, well, you know, some of these short films, they're just making them as a calling card so they can go to Sundance and make a, a longer film out of it. And I say, fuck them. Let's look at the beautiful films they made as a short and let's reward those people who made a beautiful film not trying to get over, but because they love the form of cinema. And Scorsese said, by God, you're right, Abbas, <laughs> let's do that. So sometimes it's a bit suspicious to plot your way. Cinema's a beautiful form, and all of us in this room, could we could make a film if we believe in it, and it's something we choose to express. So if you're making a film to get you something else, maybe you're doing it the wrong way, in, in maybe Abbas Kiristami's opinion, you know? Maybe the beauty is in the love of the form, not in what it will get me. And I've had interesting things where I, I'm on the board of a group called the, uh, the Ghetto Film School. I don't do much, but I speak with them every year. And I also have given talks in places like Princeton University. And I found that in Princeton, the people would ask me, how do I get an agent? How do I get the money? How do I you know, become famous? And the kids in the ghetto film school would ask things like, do you think different colors affect our emotions and we should be attentive to them? What do you think about pauses in the, str in, in the flow of the film? You know. So I don't know, I, I, I respond more to those who love the beauty of the form, and I, that's just my personal inclination. I'm with Abbas Karastami on that one. <laughs> I don't know. Hi, uh, first of all, uh, as someone said already, but thank you for coming to Portugal. It's an honor, uh, especially because Broken Flowers is one of my favorite films of all time. And I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. Uh, wow, thank you. Thanks for having us here. It's a pleasure. Um, We're taking a lot of your food with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had three questions. Two of them are, have already been answered. Uh, so I guess my final question is regarding the soundtrack and the pauses in the film. Uh, something that Roger Ebert once said about all the films was that uh, he used a lot of pauses where nothing happened as a transition for the scene. And I've always wondered, uh, because I've seen that a lot in your films as well, and I've always wondered uh, about the meaning and the importance of those pauses. And the other question is regarding the soundtrack is, uh, when you're making the film, do you point the soundtrack ahead or do you just uh, uh, do it on the editing uh, while you're editing the film? Well, I'll answer the first question. The second question first, the... Uh you know, often I have very strong ideas about the soundtrack, but it's not planned, but it, it, the essence of it is, is working in me. For example, 
I knew that this film, we wanted a score that was electronic music, basically. And I didn't know exactly what. Uh, we ended up making it ourselves. But I, I just knew, I, I love the history of electronic music, and uh, I'd never scored a film with it before. So we wanted that kind of ambient electronic feeling for the film. Our only strategy, Carter and I, was we, we would use electronic, primarily electronic instruments, and we would, but we would not use sequenced, uh, we, we would not let the instruments really be playing themselves, we're playing them in an analog approach. So we didn't use any sequencing on the synthesizers, but just played them. So that that's kind of was the inclination for this, and then there's a lot of source music in the bar. Um, the other part, what was the other question? That yeah, um, well, I, you know, I've been accused of making films out of the parts of films other people would leave out, <laughs> which I, I kind of like. I made one film uh, called Night on Earth that is just about taxi rides and in most films they get in the taxi cut they get out you know um, but instead we made a whole film where it's just in the taxi and where they get in and out isn't really that important so I and I must say I and I'm not saying that because this because this guy Ron Padgett is here but the New York School of Poets in a way are my godfathers and uh, this is Ron and Kenneth Koch and Frank O'Hara and John Ashbery and James Schuyler and David Shapiro and m many other incredible poets. And uh, they have taught me, in a way, the, the beauty of detail and of not necessarily the dramatic thing. Um, so the, the thing that you might not present as dramatic might be the thing you create something from. And that's not very articulate on my part, but that's been a big guide for me. Uh, we use a poem in the film by William Carlos Williams, uh, This Is Just To Say, where he, he reads to Laura this poem about leaving a note on the table that I, I ate your plums that you were saving for breakfast, you know? This is just a minor detail of life, but yet this is a very, very beautiful poem, and I take cues from, from these kind of guides in a way. And so the pauses, the insignificant things are sometimes the things that I like to accumulate and I find move, more, more moving than the, the obvious dramatic things. But thanks for your question. Thanks for having us here. Wow. Good. They're still here too, Ron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, the, the funny thing about making a film, and I joke with people, sometimes people come up and say, wow, I really like your film. And I say, oh, wow, thanks, I haven't seen it. <laughs> and it's partly a joke, but it's partly not a joke, because if you make a film, you, you are robbed of the experience of seeing it for the first time and entering a world that you don't know where it's going, because you wrote the damn thing, you're in the production, shooting it, editing it, you know, it's not, it's not new to you. But I really believe that a film or any work of expression is like electrical current and it only really works when you plug it into the outlet. And so when the circuit is completed. So you, you know, seeing our film, you're the you're the circuit, you're the complete completion of it. So, you know, I, I just, I'm so appreciative that you are even here, you know, and in, I'm happy that literally dozens of people have seen my films. <laughs> so anyway, I really thank you for, for being interested and spending your time to go into this, this world we, we made. Thank you, Jim. And uh, I think now we have to finish because there is another uh, day. day, and there is another <laughs> projection <laughs> coming. And Jim will be with us tomorrow. He's a gimme danger. And thank you for, you know, not only 
for everything that you, you made until now, that we are going to make, I, ho I hope, but that uh, you can, you know, it's just today, you just proved it in our, our lives, even if they are monotonous. The poetry, wow. poetry is here. Paolo thank Branco, thank you, and thank all you he's done. <laughs> thank you. I, this, this, this man is, uh, we're finished. Paolo Branco is responsible not just for this film festival, for so many beautiful gifts to cinema. So, wow, just thank you for all you've done. <laughs>